Okay, welcome students. Uh, we're going to do a skateboard demonstration uh, up here in the front of the classroom uh, in a few minutes. Uh, raise your hand if you have a skateboard today. One, two, just two? All right, do you guys feel like doing a skateboard demonstration? Are you up for it? Sweet, excellent. Okay, um, first thing that we're going to do today uh, after reviewing the SI schedule, uh, did you have anybody uh, yes yesterday yeah, for SI? Good, good. All right, uh, we're going to do a quick review of uh, one item from homework two. Uh, so you might want to take some notes. Uh, and uh, just so you know, the homework is designed to be a study tool, all right, so that you can go back and review it as you prepare for a given. You in the back with a backwards hat. Please sit in front of Roque or, or forward of that. Are you in this class? Yeah, okay. In front of Roque, please. I don't know. We still got some stragglers. Yeah, just to get everybody up to the front. Uh, anyways, they're good. The homeworks are good. So even if you if you mess up one of them, okay, you 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 have a, a little bit lower score than you want, but uh, you can get that back on the exams if you use that for a study tool. Okay, so everything we do is like a study tool, including YouTube. You know, I. I was talking to a student earlier uh, this morning, uh, and what the student does is take notes in lecture, but then, um, you know, maybe an hour later or later in the day, uh, that student actually goes into YouTube and reviews, and then the student used this word, uh, make, I, I make my notes a lot crisper which I've never used that uh, adjective for notes, but I think it makes sense, I guess, you know, nice and squared away. You know, you want to get your notes squared away, uh, which is always the case. All right. Now, let's do a review of this velocity graph problem. Uh, and maybe you want to graph a sketch of each of these. Uh, velocity graph U, K, and S. Here they are, and the, the question uh, for this problem is um, which graph might represent an object moving in the gravitational field uh, weaker than Earth? Now, here on Earth, our gravitate at the surface of the Earth anyways, uh, 9.8 meters per second squared downward. Okay. So, and the velocity graph, the slope of the velocity graph is the acceleration. So, when I talk about slope uh, on a velocity graph, you guys on the rowing team should know this by now. Uh, the, the, the slope is rise over the run. Remember that from like high school, uh, Algebra 2 class and whatnot? The slope of a graph is the rise over the run. And so these ones go downward, they dip as they run to the right, so that's a negative slope, okay? And this one, let's take a look at this one. It starts up here at 9.8 meters per second in the positive half of the graph, right? So it's moving to the right. It's accelerating that way. No, it's moving this way. But it gets slower and slower. It's slowing down. And eventually it's down to zero right here after one second. All right? So this one, and you can see that down here. Let me get my cursor. Uh, oh, let me turn my sheet, sheet my, my seat around here a little bit. Okay, right down here at the bottom, we have the list of the, uh, the velocity values uh, at time t equals zero and time t equals one. That helps you uh, understand the graph. So that's kind of 
it's not really redundant information, but it's reinforcing information in case you're in case you're good on graphs, you can read it right off the graph. If you're not so good on graphs, you can look at this little list and then make sense of the graph. Now, if we have by some coincidence uh, a velocity graph problem on exam one, which is coming up, then I will use it'll look something like this. In other words, there'll be a graph. And then there'll be a list of information about the graph that kind of reinforce each other. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, now this one has a downward slope, and it it, it loses 9.8 meters per second of rightward velocity in one second. All right, so that's a negative 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration. Delta V over delta T. Okay, Antonio, you're... Antonio, sit up here in the front, right next to Anna. That's where the front, or over here by, by uh, yeah, you got your choice. Um, so that one's good. So U is, okay, that's Earth. So that's, that's not the right answer. All right, now let's look at S. Here's S, and this one also is dipping. Uh, now, this one starts at zero up here. All right, at time t equals zero, it's up there. And the list says v of zero is equal to 0, 0.0 meters per second. All right, so this is like holding it and then dropping it. And then one second later down here, uh, it's at negative 9.8 meters per second. So now it's going downward, okay? All right, so both of these are, are good. These are good earth based velocity graphs, okay, for simple free fall type motion. However, this one right here, graph K, if you look at this one carefully, this one, it, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have enough of a dip. It's dipping as you go to the right, yes, but it starts at one, and then in one second, it finishes that negative one. So that's a total dip of negative two in one second. So this one uh, would have an acceleration of negative two meters per second squared. So this is the one that might be some other planet, all right? And so that's what you look for. You look for the slope. And hopefully you can figure it out mentally you know, from the information in the graph or the list down below the graph and figure out rise over run. And these are all sufficient information uh, to give you rise over run for one second. You know, the it's actually not a rise. It's a, it's a dip. So it's a negative rise, you could say, uh, for one second of, uh, of the motion, all three of them. And this is realistic because uh, here's a picture of a, uh, astronaut and if you've ever seen like in YouTube the videos of the uh, moon astronauts you know they can really jump up there this guy if you look at it he's about he's got a vertical leap you know like uh, who's got a great vertical leap who Kobe? No, he doesn't. He, he's dead now. He doesn't have, God rest his soul. I mean, but he used to have a good vertical leap. No, who's who's the current player that's got him? He's retired too. He was retired. Uh, who was who's the current player that's got a good vertical leap? Nate Robinson. Nate Robinson. That's right. So Nate Robinson is skying up there. Just maybe would like to sky as much as this guy. All right. Can you imagine somebody like? Nate Robinson or Michael Jordan on the moon, you know, like Space Jam on the moon. Oh, my goodness. He'd be able to, you know, Michael Jordan would be able to launch, forget about the free throw line. He'd be able to jump at half court and, and still slam dunk it if it was on the moon, Space Jam. All right, now I got some clicker questions for you. Turn your clicker question on. Multiple choice. And this is to reinforce the velocity graph uh, ideas that we just talked about, okay? 
All right, but see, this is a different question. Uh, the first question was, which one could represent another planet? Okay, we, we settled that one. And let's take a look at this one. Which graph could represent you uh, dropping a water balloon uh, from the top of the library? Think about it. Same graphs, K, S, and U. Yo, in the back, what are you doing back there? Clicking? All right. You're supposed to be sitting up here in row K or, or, or further instead of way back there. I can just see those little eyeballs peeping over the, side, over the chairs. That's all, you know, it's all right. You can sit back there for now. I won't I won't take away your birthday or anything. Good. All right. Ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, let's see what you guys voted for. Ooh, ooh. Well, my wonderful students, uh, we got some splaining to do here. There's a little bit of a spread in the data, so let's take a look. Let's talk them over. And the same thing as before. Let's take a look at each of them. Now, the K we know is, is out. So, uh oh, uh, three people voted for K. No, K is def That's another planet. Okay, so that couldn't be, that couldn't be the top, that, that could not be you dropping from the top of a, the library on another planet even. Why is that? What's the, uh, go ahead. It's just falling. Yeah, but this one is above the graph, so it has some upward motion to start. All right, so that's not dropping it. That's that's maybe you tossing it up, you know, which is a strategy. You know, if you're up on top of the library and you're on another planet, you toss it up a little bit, and then it, it goes back down towards the Earth. But, you know, this is not a straight drop problem. All right, so A is out. Now, B is graph S, um, and that's this one. Uh, yeah, so this one starts at zero, and it, it requires downward velocity. Good. And so this one's a possibility. Now, what about you? Uh-oh, this is Earth, but and it's so this one over here, K, is some other planet, uh, and this is Earth, but it's starting with some upward speed. And then you lose it by the time you get to one second. And then in the next second, you're, you've acquired negative 9.8 meters per second downward. So this is like you tossing the water balloon up and then letting it fall down on your, your friend on the sidewalk. Okay. So the answer here uh, – on, let me get my cursor back over here. Come on, baby. Where's my? Here we go. Uh, is graph S. So make a note of that. And students, notice that I'm asking you a, a, a question in English that you use the graphs to answer. So I'm going to be asking you, all semester questions like that. Look at this diagram. Look at this graph. Look at this data and tell me something about it. Or at least answer yes or no about it. You know. So is it from the top of, is it dropping a water balloon? Yes. Graph S is yes. All right. Let's try another question. All right. So here's the here's the run through. 
Um, okay, now I want you to hit the refresh key because the next question is going to have more than one correct answer. Right now, I want you to, on this next one, I want you to uh, type in a letter and then uh, that you think is the best answer. Okay, how would you describe the object in graph U? So there's graph U. And go ahead and type in A, B, C, D, or E. And I think you have to hit the send key. Or you can just type in the letter. You know, you can use the up and down arrow key as well to choose A, B, C, or D, or E. And then hit the send key. But don't type in any words. Just give me a single letter, A, B, C, D, or E. Why are you typing in? Why are you? I hear somebody clicking. Why are you clicking? You don't need to click. You just have to hit the, the buttons for A, B, C, D, or E. But, you know, definitely consult with your neighbor. Talk it over. That's good. I see people doing that. See these guys up in front? They're just kind of going like this. Pointing and stuff. That's good. Twenty seconds now. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys got here. Now this is gonna be interesting. Let me take a look at this. Uh, I didn't want you to type in more than one letter, which I see that a few of you did. Um, what, there's there's some answers up here. So make sure CE, ooh, a lot of Ds. DCA, E, E, A, E, C, E, D. You know, this is, this is interesting. I, I was hoping for one letter, but actually now I'm glad some of you Typed in more than one letter. Um, uh, the correct answer on this uh, is uh, its rise time is one second. Yeah. The amount, who voted for C? Raise your hand if you voted for C. That's a hard one. But what the, what it, the, the, here's how, go ahead and write, write down this list of concepts and write down that C is, is one of the correct answers. Um, here's how you figure it out. I mean, you look at your your uh, graph, and it's a free fall graph, okay? Negative 9.8 meters per second squared is the slope. And at, at one second, it has no vertical component of velocity. It's down to zip zap, okay? So that's at one. So that's at the top of the arc. If, if you throw it straight up. It gets to the top at one second. If you if you toss it, you know, out in an arc, it gets to the top of the arc in one second. So that's the rise time. And then it takes another one second to get all the way back down to the same elevation. All right. Now, is that the only correct answer? Um, well, let me get my cursor back over here. Uh, there's your there's your key for. For C. Now here's another one. Uh, I know a bunch of you voted for D. How many of you voted for D? Ooh, a lot. Very good. Yeah, it moves upward for one second, then falls for one second. So the the uh, 
upward for one second, that's this one, where the y component of the velocity is positive. It's above the timeline. And then over here in the next one second interval, the graph is below the timeline. It's negative, so that means you're falling downward. Okay. Now, um, let me get my cursor back over here. And all right. Now, uh, A and C. Um, initially, it is falling at 9.8 meters per second. It's not falling. It's rising. Okay. So that one's out. If you chose A, make a note. If it's if it's uh, upward speed is 9.8 meters per second and it's upward positive, it's not falling. It's rising. Uh, B, it starts with upward speed 9. Okay, that's so that's good, and it continues upward for two seconds. Oh, that's not good. It continues upward for one second, but then by the time it gets over here to one second. It's done going upward, my friend, and it's starting to go downward now. So now you're on the other side of the arc. You're starting to cut back downwards, okay? Uh, so let's keep going here, all right? So uh, the idea that it moves upward for one second and that, that it moves downward for one second, uh, that's in these two parts of the velocity graph. Now, E is also wrong. Its acceleration is negative downward, so the velocity is always downward, too. That's not true. The first half of the motion is actually positive. All right, so over here, in the first half, that's not downward motion. That's upward motion, okay, because it's above the, above the time axis. All right, so now remember, these are abstract graphs but and so it's tricky to make a sense even for an engineering student it's tricky to make an english sentence from the graph or vice versa you know take an english sentence and to do something about the graph or make a judgment or decision about the graph all right now on exam one which is coming up um shortly uh not this week but in you know I don't know, I think it's in a couple weeks. Next Tuesday. Um, you might have to think about some velocity graphs. I'm not saying anything, I'm just saying. Okay. Okay, now last, let's just continue with Newton's laws of uh, motion. And we discussed the first two laws of motion. And this is the famous image I like to think about, you know, driving a Ferrari off a cliff. And that's where we were talking about the mythical frictionless plane and the idea of inertia, that an object is indifferent if all forces are balanced, like on the mythical frictionless plane. Uh, it is indifferent to being in a state of motion or at rest. So it tends to continue in the same direction at the same speed unless there's an unbalanced force. Uh, and that actually became Newton's first law of, of motion. And then the second law of motion uh, was about the contest of forces, like these two guys battling for a – boy, look at that guy. He's, his head is almost up at the rim, and his arms are just horizontal. Whew. That guy's got some – he's got some sky. And look at this guy over here. He's just kind of, he wants to get up there, but he cannot. So this guy, uh, that's Georgia Tech. I thought this was UCF, but it's Georgia Tech now that I look at it. Anyway, so the contest of forces, you know, who wins? And we talked about this set of notes, uh, which is on the YouTube from last Thursday. And, uh, you know, F equals MA, that's the big law, Newton's second law. Uh, and... In terms of acceleration, it's A equals F net divided by M. And in terms of the force, it's F net equals MA. And we'll be, excuse me, we'll be using that uh, all through the semester. 
Uh, so we're not ever going to be, you know, too far away from F equals MA. And, you know, these guys, the, the engineering students over here that I give the business to, you know, that, that they're going to be making their living off of F equals MA. I mean, eventually, hopefully, hopefully they'll make a living off of it. And it, cause it rule, it, it, you know, it rules the cosmos. All right. Now let's do some more details. Uh, about Newton's second law. And if you if you didn't make lecture last Thursday, uh, you can see my animated version of that previous slide in YouTube. Now, uh, Newton's second law, here it is down here, uh, F equals MA and A equals F net over M. And usually you don't write in F net here. It's kind of understood. Uh, but you can if you want as a subscript down here on this third one. Now, up here, that's the definition of acceleration, the change in the velocity divided by the elapsed time, okay? And here's a version of Newton's second law that is going to be a little bit more illustrative for us because... It uses, this is F equals MA, but instead of writing the letter A here, we have the quotient delta V over delta T from the definition, All right? Now, both forms are fine, and both forms are righteous, but this one is a little bit more instructive uh, for us because um, it tells you, uh, first of all, all the different measurements that you have to make. You cannot measure a force. A force is an abstract concept. I mean, you know, we, we make our living and we study with forces. You know, NASA and, and everybody, every scientist uses forces, but it's an abstract concept. Um, there's, no, there's no international... You know, there's not like some museum with the international unit of force. But there is for everything else on the right side of this equation. Mass, there's a, there's a fancy place over in Paris, France, where they have the, the you know, the standard kil kilogram, okay, and a standard meter. And there, there used to be a way of, in, in, in Paris, France, of measuring a second uh, a standard second, but we use a different method, you know, so we can't put that in a, um, in a museum, but everything on the right side here, you know, mass, um, delta V, that's uh, distance and time measurements, you know, a bunch of them, and then delta T, that's a couple time measurements. So those are all things that we know how to measure. You know, you measure mass by weighing something in a balance, you know, see if it balances or not. And, you know, we have modern electronic balances that work a little differently, but that's the basic way a balance works. So the measurements needed are time, distance, and mass, okay? And I'm going to talk to you about the mass measurements in a few minutes. Uh, but you can always, you can read about it in the textbook as well. I think it's in Chapter 1, actually. Um, then calculations are velocities in the acceleration, all right? Now, the other thing that's important about this version in terms of force being a derived concept or a, what we say, what we call it, a derived quantity, it's not, it's not something that, you know, is a set bunch of something in a, under a glass jar on a pedestal in France, Paris, something like that. There's nothing like that for force. It's a derived quantity. The other thing is in this equation, uh, the stopping time delta T, if you think of this as a stopping problem, you know, not, you know, if you're in free fall, you're just free falling and all this stuff holds and stuff. But if you think about delta V being um, uh, V1 being some positive number and V2 being equal to zero, that's, your, that's stopping, then stopping then delta t is going to be a stopping time and so the more stopping time you have the bigger the denominator is so the bigger delta t is the smaller the force 
all right? And by the same token, less stopping time means a smaller denominator and therefore a bigger force. Now, um, it, it, it go ahead and make a note. This, I don't have a slide for this uh, this semester, but you can think about it. If you have a car traveling at 15 miles an hour and you are up north in the winter and you're driving on a snowy road and it, it's, it's, it's covered with snow. So a lot of times before they get them plowed out and or sometimes even if they do plow them, it just gets packed down snow and that can be really slick. Okay. And kind of like being at an ice skating rink. Not quite that bad, but almost that bad. And you can really lose control of your car easily. And I grew up up there, and you just you just develop ways of handling skids and stuff. But but one thing that's that's nice about it up there, if you lose control of your car and you go into a snow drift, your car you know is not damaged. I mean, you, you might need to get towed or something, but I mean at least your car is not damaged. And the reason for that is the snow bank will stop you. But it takes a good second or so to do so, depending on how deep the snowbank is. All right. So it's a it's a gentle stop, a snowbank. All right. So that's a big delta T. Now compare that to uh, here in Orlando, you're going 15 miles an hour, and you accidentally plow into a telephone pole. All right, and your car is going to stop like that in a very short, you know, like maybe um, 0 0.05 seconds, bang, you're stopped. Okay, same delta T or same delta V, uh, 15 miles per hour to down to zero uh, for stop to be a stop, but much, much smaller delta T. And which car gets smashed up? Not the snowdrift car, the one that stops in front of, gets stopped by a telephone pole or a brick wall or something. And the reason I, I say this is because one time I was leaving UCF, and I don't know about you guys, but I leave, you know, several years ago when I lived, you know, west of campus, I would just go out, you know, about four or five miles out on university and then cut up towards you know, Popkin stuff. Um, and so I would, every night I would go home on university and I'll never forget it. This one day, you know where the, um, those, those, uh, apartments are on the other side of Alafaya and like the McDonnell is there and, and burger Fi and, and all that, that big that corner. that used to be a shopping center. You know, I think there was a Publix in there and a bunch of little store and McDonald's was still where it is now, but everything else was torn down and then they turned it into, you know, all those nice apartments and stores and stuff. But back in those days when it was a shopping center, there are a couple different places. And I'll never forget, I was driving out there and I saw a guy, some student that he, he was, you know, he was leaning on his car and his car was plowed into like a telephone pole right at where you turn in to go into the shopping center. And I thought, this is an idiot. Uh, this is an individual that, as soon as they leave UCF campus, they become ma raving maniacs on the road. Did you ever notice that? Like three or four in the afternoon, the people on uni – I'm not going to accuse anybody. I'm not going to look at anybody, but I know in this group, there's got to be at least one person – that drives like a raving maniac on university on the way home, three, four o'clock in the afternoon after this class. Now, I'm not saying nothing, and I, I'm not looking at anybody, but there's a very good chance. Hey, uh, let's see, there's about 150 of us in here. Who's got a birthday today? Raise your hand if it's your birthday. Nobody, you know, that's. All right, whose whose birthday was yesterday? Anybody? Bueller. 
Now I know you're not dead. Okay, whose birthday is tomorrow? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Oh, one person. Yay. Happy birthday. Um, they say that if you're in a room with 22 people, that there's a 50-50 chance that somebody has your birthday. Did you know that? I think it's something like that. 22 people, 50-50. Anyway, so there's a there's a fairly good – now, I'm not looking at anybody, but there's a fairly good chance that you're – somebody in here, unnamed, is one of those maniacs out on university. Oh, my God. Some of the things that you see – and, you know, and I, I make fun of the guy that went into the pole and he dented up his car. It was all bashed in. But, you know, there's a little further down, you may have noticed, there's one of those little signs where it says somebody got killed. Um, you know, you've seen those, right? You know, and there's flowers, there's flowers there today, I noticed. And that's really sad, you know, but I think that was somebody on a motorcycle getting sides. That's a whole other thing. But anyways, uh, so stopping, you know, so you want to avoid stopping in a tele by a telephone pole or a brick wall and wrecking your car. And the reason is Delta T is so much smaller that the stopping force is really big. It, it's enough force to mush up the front end of your rig, all right, versus a snow pile, a snow drift. It'll stop you, but you'll be five feet in. I mean, you, you know, if you stop by a brick wall or a telephone pole or something, you stop on a dime. But a snow drift, you know, you just kind of you know, ease your way in there and slow down to a stop. So now this, this uh, I think this was in the homework, uh, this whole idea of, you know, doing boxes, doing your plyometric workout. You know, you jump down to the floor, you jump up to the box and back and forth. Uh, the whole thing there is um, if you bend your knees when you land, that's increasing the delta T for your stopping time. And therefore, it diminishes the landing force. And it's less punishing on your knees. You know, can you imagine doing box jumping like that and landing straight legged? Oh my goodness. That would be one. You'd get a rep of one and then you'd have to take a break, you know, because your knees would be just, you know, myrtleized. Anyway, so this whole thing about stopping time, it comes from that uh, equation F equals M times delta V over delta T. All right, and you can see that you can see the anatomy of it there. For the same delta V, a small delta T gives you a lot of force, and a big delta T is the snow drift, not quite as much force. It doesn't bash up your car. Now let's do some more clicking. We're going to do some multiple choice items here, and this one is uh, this next question is. Let me set this to multiple choice. Okay, go ahead and hit the refresh key now. And here's your question. And take notes on this because this is actually kind of a notes. Your liter bottle of water has a mass of 1.000 kilograms. It accelerates from your pull force at exactly one meter per second squared. What is the size of your net pull force? So F equals MA. Look at those answers and think. F equals MA. Twenty seconds to vote starting right now. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One zero. Okay, let's see what you guys got. Um, 
Yeah. Um, 81% of you answered A. And hey, you guys, that's the official unit of force in the metric system. Okay. In other words, uh, and we call it the Newton. Capital N is the symbol for Newtons. All right. And so it's basically one kilogram times one meter per second squared. That's your F, that's your M and your A. And we define that as a, a Newton. Uh, one kilogram meter per second squared. All right. And uh, I like this. I like this example because uh, it, it also shows that a kilogram is is uh, equal to a thousand liters, you know, one liter of water. And that's actually the definition of the gram. Uh, the, it's, it's not the kilogram that's the basic unit of measurement. It's the uh, it's the gram. Uh, and it's basically one cubic cent, the mass of one cubic centimeter of liquid water at a certain temperature uh, in Paris, France, or something like that. Okay, now, uh, so that's the basic uh, unit of force. Now I'm going to give you a numeric question, and I think you guys know how to do this from the homework. All right, so hit your refresh key again. Well, now we're back to multiple choice. We're going to do a 342 kilogram T-Rex. All right. Calculate the weight. Uh oh, uh, ignore that. This is numeric. Sorry. Okay, hit your refresh key and try again. Uh, I have to remember to delete that one. Um, calculate the weight force of a 342 kilogram. T-Rex, and use Earth's surface gravity. And so just give me a positive number. So type in your number to the nearest whole number of newtons, and then... Uh, Hit the send key. And, you know, double check with your neighbor and kind of, you know, ask them, if did you get the same thing? Or, you know, what do you do with the 342 kilograms? That kind of thing. And you guys, this is going to be a child's play by the end of the semester for you. You're going to amaze yourselves with how skilled you will become by the end of the semester. Right, yes? Always. It's amazing. That's one of the reasons I love UCF. Okay, uh, 10 seconds starting now. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Don't forget to hit the send key. Okay. Now let me hit the stop. Let's see what you guys voted for. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Gracious. Uh, raise, I'm impressed. Uh, raise your hand if you voted for 33.52. Sweet. Okay, uh, that's 84% of you. Uh, I see that a few people vote for 33.51. Uh, better do your round off skills a little bit uh, more carefully. Okay, so there's the answer for that. Now, about mass. Let's talk about mass uh, for a few more minutes. Okay. And as I've mentioned before, this is the, the quantity or the mass is the quantity in which inertia resides. 
We call it inertial mass. And it's measured in kilograms. And, and what it means is that the more of it you have, the harder it is to change your dynamical state. So it, and this is like the example I gave you before of shopping carts, okay? If you have um, a shopping cart that's loaded with flowers from the store, cut flowers from the store, Versus a shopping cart that's loaded with canned vegetables, okay? Now, one of them's going to have a lot of mass, and it's going to be harder to get it going. Once it is going, it's going to be harder to stop it. So changing the dynamical state of the shopping cart loaded with canned goods is going to be tricky. It's going to be a lot more difficult. Uh, so the unit that, the, that we use in, in the, the metric system is kilogram, and really it's based on the gram, which is a cubic centimeter of liquid H2O. And uh, so what you do essentially, um, at least in the initial part of the metric system, was you take your object and you balance it in a balance with a given amount of water. So here's a liter of water over here, okay? And that's going to bounce something that's one kilogram. Now, if you have a basketball, a basketball is less than one kilogram, so it's not going to balance, all right? So what you would do is, all right, let me take away 10 cubic centimeters of water and then see if it balances. And let me take away another 10. You know, let me take another. And you basically you're going to take away about... Uh, 38 um, or 380 uh, cubic centimeters of water because the mass the mass of a uh, of an NBA basketball is about uh, 0.62 kilograms. So in this picture they don't they don't uh, they don't match. But you know you count them up and the number of the cc's that does balance that's the mass. Okay, so you would say. 420 grams for an NBA basketball, or uh, I should say uh, 620 grams for an NBA basketball, about 0 0.62 uh, kilograms, all right? So in this one, the, the you know, you have 1,000 grams over there with your liter bottle of water. So it's actually 1,000 grams plus a little bit more for the plastic, but that's, Excuse me. Uh, that's pretty close to a thousand. We'll just call it a thousand grams. And that basketball is less, so the basketball's up, and the grams are down. But when you get up to bounce, that's the exact number of grams of water uh, in one side, and this exact number of grams of basketball on the other side, or whatever it else it is that you're measuring uh, the mass of. Now. Nowadays, we have electronic balances that work on the basis of springs and stuff. So what they do is they calibrate the spring with known masses. So they, they have to have a mass that they know, you know, at some point from a balance. And then they calibrate their springs and figure out, okay, one kilogram depresses the spring by so much. Two kilograms depresses the spring by you know, so much, and then they figure out, you know, and then electronically they display the answer and stuff, but it's basically like that. And they have very finely tuned springs to do that. And other, there's other ways to make a, a balance balance itself. All right, now, directionality. The net force of an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration, okay, and it points in the same direction as the acceleration. So wherever the acceleration is pointing, you know, to the left, if you're turning left, uh, or straight ahead, if you're accelerating, if you're skipping faster, that's the direction. Ooh, I'm all starting. To, somebody up here in the front must be yawning to get me started off. I, I must have subconsciously seen that. So whatever the acceleration is doing, and the acceleration is something that you can measure, you know, by looking at directions, meter stick, 
and then time intervals and stuff, you can get the acceleration, the size of it, and the direction by making your distance measurements and your time measurements. So what this means is if you have a force from 45 degrees away from your velocity, like this car, okay, this little red Ferrari, okay, if it's moving forward but it, it gets a little bit of a force from something slamming into it from aft and to the, and to the left, it's going to get some forward and some rightward force from that, okay, from that collision. All right. So if if that happens to you at 45, you get a speed change because that that little uh, yellow ball over there is going to give it a little bit of forward push, and it's going to give it a little bit of rightward push as well. So it'll also uh, change the direction of the Ferrari. Now it won't be by much because the Ferrari is a big vehicle, and you know that's just a little. Uh, it looks actually that looks like a grapefruit. The one thing of that is uh, volleyball, I guess. Yeah, volleyball. So the volleyball will give it a little bit of a, a rightward jolt and a little bit of a forward uh, jolt. All right? And that corresponds to um, direction change and speed change. Now, the way that we write that is this way. It, it's it, the vector of the force, the arrow on top means vector. This is the net force. It's equal to the, the mass, and the mass is just a number, okay, a number of kilograms. There's no such thing as leftward kilograms or vertical kilograms. It's just kilograms. But the acceleration can be upward or leftward or any direction. Okay, so all the directionality comes from the acceleration, all right? So if you see something accelerating to the west, heading down to university, um, then you know that there's the force um, is pointing in that direction. All right, now let me pause for questions. Okay, let's keep going. Now let's talk about, we're going to talk about things accelerating in a certain direction. And this law, the third law, the law of action and reaction, this tells you how things move. All right? Uh, and we, we've heard this, you know, probably since fifth grade science class. For every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. And we don't really think about it. We just think, okay, something else is going to happen in the other direction. All right? And we don't really think much more about it. But there's a very precise way of looking at equal but opposite reaction. All right? Equal in size but opposite in direction. And this is a picture of Hussein, of Usain Bolt um, sprinting uh, coming out of a curve, I guess, on the 400. Uh, or the 200, and uh, we're going to talk about the forces that accelerate him down the track. I mean, he doesn't do it unless he exerts some force, uh, and you can see his foot in contact with the track there. But before we do that, I want to do a skateboard demonstration. So now I need two st the two skateboard students to get their skateboards and come on down here to the front. Come on over here where there's some room for you to skate. All right. Now let me pause the podcast or pause the. Both have the same interaction time just by the definition of contact. You know, you break contact, you don't have any more interaction, at least here. All right. Uh, and, and so now what Newton says. Now, these two skaters look about the same size, all right? And I don't know who's, who's stronger and who's not as strong, 
We could have a wrestling match, you know, WWF and stuff like that, but but that would take up too much time. So we'll just assume they're about the same strength, about the same size. And they give each other – now, Sir Isaac Newton said big or little, strong or strong or weak. Each person is going to push off with the same amount of force. Matter of fact, um, Joyce, I want you to go over here to the wall, and Caitlin, you're going to do it next. Uh, face the wall and push yourself off from the wall. So mount up on your skateboard. Okay. Face the wall. Now push yourself off. All right. Now she pushed on the wall. She pushed that way into the wall. So how come she went the other direction? The, the wall exerted a force. Would that work on a wall made of jello? No, because the jello doesn't have any rigidity. So just like a tabletop, there's a rigidity force in the in the in the wall. Now, Caitlin, I want you to do the same. Now let's just see what Caitlin could do. Okay. Yay. Okay. So Caitlin pushed off. She pushed the, the, the wall didn't move, not much anyways. Not that you could see. I mean, microscopically maybe it moved, you know, like a nanometer or something. But Caitlin moved quite a bit. Right? She accelerated out towards you guys. All right. So that's the force of the wall causing Caitlin and before her, Joyce, to accelerate away from the wall, all right? They pushed it, the wall. The wall didn't do much, but the wall pushed back the same amount of force. Uh, Caitlin, let's just do a variation. Uh, go ahead and uh, mount up and face the wall again. And uh, this time, I want you to push off with just the we the most weenish force possible. Yay. Okay, so that's a really small force. She just barely pushed, and the wall didn't really push her that much. You know, she got a few inches. That's about it. All right. Now, if this were Galileo's frictionless plane, uh, she would have kept on going, both of them. But we got all this friction from the carpet. You know, so even out on a sidewalk, those things are going to stop eventually. Uh, but... Uh, this demonstrates Sir Isaac Newton's uh, third law, the law of action and reaction. Now, uh, let's give these guys a hand. <laughs> Caitlin and Joyce, so thank you for, for demonstrating with your, uh, with your land yachts. And uh, now I want to get back to taking some notes here for the last few minutes of class. Um, what you just saw is um, – a demonstration of Sir Isaac Newton's third law. Now, here's a kind of a stylized image. Can you bring me back to 50% power? Uh, of an astronaut and a spacecraft, okay, uh, pushing you off from each other. Now, the force of the spacecraft on the astronaut is off to the left, all right? And the force from the astronaut on the spacecraft is off to the right. Now, theoretically, they're the same amount of force, all right? And that's what we call third law pairs. But what doesn't happen is they don't have uh, identical recoil speeds. In other words, you know, the, the spaceman is probably a little bit lighter than the spacecraft because spacecraft is made of metal. And unless that's a Terminator inside that spacesuit, it's probably lighter. All right. So the space. So so in this reaction, in this interaction, I should say, the the astronaut's going to blaze off uh, to the left, and the spacecraft is going to kind of poke along a little bit to the right, depending on how heavy, it, how much inertia it has. Okay. Because they and what Sir Isaac Newton says is those two forces, what we call a third law pair, a third law pair of forces, 
They're the same size, the same number of newtons. And of course, delta T is the same. The interaction time, you know, so like, you know, two tenths of a second or whatever it is. Uh, but the, the, the forces are opposite directions, right? So now this, those guys up on the space station and the space shuttle before that, when they went out on a spacewalk, they had to be really careful uh, as to how they, you know, when they were try, out there trying to do repair work or, or set something up, you know, and a lot of times they had their feet um, strapped down uh, onto, the, uh, onto the spacecraft for safety. You know, because otherwise they go, you know, the, the, you know, can you imagine the astronaut pushing on the space station? It's not going to move anywhere, the, the, but the astronaut's going to go flying, you know, unless he's strapped down. All right. Now, I want to take another look at the skateboarders uh, examples and stuff. Um, and this is actually found in, I think it's chapter four. Um, and let's do an example of two. Now, these are two fictitious skateboarders, but think of them as like uh, Caitlin and Joyce, okay? So the two guys are Carl and Bob, I think. Okay, so let's say that Carl has a mass of 40.0 kilograms, and he's at rest, just like Caitlin and Joyce were. They were at rest, all right, to start initially. So V subscript I, the initial speed is zero. Now Bob, uh, let's say that he has um, significantly more mass. He's got 80 kilograms. So he's a lot. So he's like the spacecraft. All right. He's going to move, but he's not going to move as much as Carl. All right. Now his initial velocity, V subscript I, is also zero. So we're starting them both at rest. Okay. And then they're going to interact. So we get them set up, and they do patty cakes, and then they push off, just like Caitlin and Joyce did. All right. Now, let's say just for a round number that they each exert uh, an interaction force of 500 newtons, okay, just to have a nice round number. And, and you'll notice here that all the numbers are nice round numbers, you know. Okay, so 500. So what that means is, that the force of Bob on Carl, FB on C, is 500 newtons. So, so Bob is pushing this direction to the right, and Carl is pushing the opposite direction. The force of Carl on Bob is pushing to the to the left. Okay, so that's a negative 500 newtons. Okay, so don't forget that minus sign over there. All right, and that's kind of like Kate and Caitlin and Joyce. One of them pushed to the to the right, and the other one pushed to the left, and they both went flying. All right, now let's say that these two skateboarders have a nice long interaction time, delta t, zero point four eight. And so in red, those are the two things that are equal sizes. The interaction force F according to Sir Isaac Newton, and the contact time according to just the definition of contact. All right. Uh, now let's take a look at accelerations. Uh, F equals MA. So let's do A equals F over M. Okay. So for Carl, uh, he gets 500 newtons from Bob to the right. And divide that by his mass, 40 kilograms. And so that's equal to 12.5 meters per second squared. So that's a little bit bigger than G, which is all right. Humans can take up to about 8 Gs of acceleration before they pass out, usually. All right, so that's Carl, A subscript C. All right, so he's, got, he's the smaller guy. Now, Bob over here, he also gets 500 newtons. So... So acceleration equals F over M. So minus 500 divided by 80. So he's got more mass, and so his acceleration is a little bit smaller, negative 6.25 meters per second squared. And remember, the minus sign here means to the left. So he's accelerating off in the, the leftward direction. All right. 
Now, let's figure out delta T. How do you get delta T? Or excuse me, delta V? You multiply whatever their acceleration is times the interaction time. All right, that's how long they're accelerating. Okay, so for Carl, delta V is his acceleration, 12.5 meters per second squared, times 0 0.48 seconds. And that works out to 6.00 meters per second. So that's his speed at the point where they lose contact. Now, if they're on the frictional, the, the mythical frictionless surface, he'll stay at that speed until he goes off the edge or until somebody lassoes him to a stop. Right, so at the at the last instant of interaction, he's got 6.00 meters per second of speed to the right. Now, car Bob over here, he's got a lot less because he's not accelerating as much. He's got the same delta T, but his acceleration is less. All right, negative 6.25 meters per second squared, quite a bit less acceleration. In fact, it's half. He's got double the mass, so half the acceleration. And so he only acquires 3 meters per second, but we express it as a negative 3.0 meters per second to signify that he's moving off to the left. Now, if we had, if we had two people up here with skateboards, one of them significantly smaller than the other, and some semesters we do, you would have noticed that. The little per the smaller person would have gone flying, and the bigger person would have just kind of barely poked along a little bit. And that's what we got in this case. Bob and Carl. Carl's much lighter, so he gets a lot more velocity. His delta V is much bigger. So the final velocity states are for Carl V subscript F positive 6.00 meters per second. And for Bob, it's uh, negative 3.00 meters per second. That's their final speed after interaction, all right? And so the thing that we're, we're, we're trying to deal with here is, okay, my, my interaction force and my interaction time are the same, but my, my delta Vs are definitely not. If you have different masses, like Bob and Carl, different amounts of inertia, you don't get the same delta V. You have the same interaction force, but you don't have the same delta V. All right? So we got kind of a problem here. And this, this thing, you know, where we have some equal um, – Force and interaction time is nice, uh, but, you know, we, we don't have equal delta Vs. All right Now, next time on Thursday, I'm going to ask you some multiple choice questions about this. And you can read. Let me skip. Hold on a second. Let's skip to the homework assignment. I want you to finish reading Chapter 3 and start reading the first part of Chapter 4. Okay, that's about Bob and Carl. Okay, go ahead and do that, and I'll see you on Thursday. You're dismissed. No homework other than reading.